Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, uh, we have a treat because we have not uh, only one guest, we have two guests. Uh, we have Adele Sears and Chip Massey uh, joining me. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, um, you know, here, because there are two of you, I'm going to try and make this kind of bio a little bit short, but you both have very interesting backgrounds and you've come together to create uh, a powerhouse of a company, which we're going to get into in a lot more detail so that everybody really understands what it is that, that you do. Um, but Adele, your background is, you know, public relations, PR firm. Uh, you've worked with companies like Lockheed Martin and Facebook, even a president from what I understand. Um, and you've also taught crisis communications at places like Princeton, Cornell, and Georgetown. Um, so, you know, you've been around the block when it comes to PR and communication. So we can, I think we safe to say that. Uh, Chip, you are the person that most people don't want to have knocking on their front door. Um, or maybe they do, depending on the situation. But you are a former FBI hostage negotiator and agent. Um, you started a business, I know, after uh, leaving that world. Uh, and then you and Adele came together and decided to, to create your company, which is now called The Convincing Company. So uh, I'll just let me pass it over to you first, Chip. Just fill us in for 30 seconds, a little bit more of like what was, you, know, you talk about being an FBI hostage negotiator uh, and then an, uh, an agent and then getting into a business. What was that business before you and Adele came together? What, what were you doing? Um, just tell us a little bit about that for a moment. Sure. And Michael, thanks for having us. Um, so, yeah, right after uh, the, the Bureau, um, I, I started a, a company uh, called Plowshare Communications, and it was designed really in, in the very beginning stages of how corporate professionals can better communicate um, using the techniques that I learned. Mm -hmm. And when I met Adele at an entrepreneur networking event, um, you know, we, we saw how our skill sets could work together, and that's that's how we started our now company, The Convincing Company. Got it. Okay. And so Adele, uh, fill in for me anything that I missed just in terms of PR company, a little bit more of like the work that you were doing prior to starting The Convincing Company with Chip. Yeah. So, um, you know, I started my career as a journalist. So I worked for George Magazine, John F. Kennedy Jr.'s publication um, in Manhattan, which was a really cool experience. And then after that, I worked for USA Today. So I was a journalist for the first six years of my career. And then I realized I had to pay my student loans back. And as much as I loved journalism, um, I went over to the dark side, as they call PR, in New York City and worked on Madison Avenue launching some huge brands like 1-800-Flowers, mm -hmm. Phone, um, you know, some some of the early dot-com, um, you know, dot-com companies. And um, uh, then September 11th happened and it motivated me to want to do more good. And so I moved to the Washington, D.C. area thinking I wanted to get in politics. Got in politics for a little while, kind of hate that. And then went back over to my PR roots, started a company, um, and, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had the company ever since I've, I've launched some household, um, name brands. I love PR. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm very good at, but I realized I wanted to do something more serious. So about halfway into my, um, having an, an agency about six years, um, into the 15 year span of having it, I realized I need to reposition my agency and really like narrow and find a niche that like mm -hmm. really, you know, made me stand out from the rest of the other PR firms that were out there. And, um, and crisis communications um, just was that niche for me. And um, that's really where Chip and I also came together. We realized that like, while both of us um, do crisis communications, we do it in very different ways and for very different reasons right like he was trying to stop the bad guy from killing people and i'm trying to stop the media and maybe people online from ruining your reputation right mm -hmm. they're both terrible situations um and we both ap uh, approached it um in different ways but we had a lot of the same ideas skill sets um you know and so we just thought wow what a cool combination of very very different careers coming together um, to offer to to offer this very unique service and what yeah. what I can say is like when I was doing crisis communications I was always super focused 
on solving the problem, right? I wanted to solve the problem and I wanted to solve it quick. And I wasn't really as much tuning into people's emotional needs, right? It's like, no, you need to do these five things you need to do them right now. Whereas when Chip came in and we're solving crises together, he's so incredibly calming. And, you know, so while I'm doing all of like the implementation and the writing and the like, you know, we're scrapping together to fix it, mm -hmm. Chip's like, how you feeling now? Right. So you got, you got the yin and the yang going, the, the yeah. balance, right? Um, each other. So I want to make this very kind of tangible and actionable for, for everybody joining us. So we're going to get into like how you guys built the business, lessons learned, best practices, um, so that people can really start to implement some of that stuff into their own business and, and see results from it. But before we do that, I just want to kind of address and understand more of how the two of you came together. So I know you said it like at an entrepreneurial networking event, but oftentimes people, they'll do something similar where they'll, they'll meet somebody in an event and they have this like dream or idea of like, wow, we would be so powerful together, right? If, if we did this, how, how did you guys kind of formalize the, the partnership? I'm really interested, you know, in, from the perspective of a consultant who maybe is thinking about a partnership or is at the early stages or has somebody say to them, hey, you know, we should partner together. How did you ensure that that committing to actually building a company together was the right thing as opposed to just like, yeah, let's, why don't we run our own separate companies and maybe we can collaborate at times if it makes sense. Where did that kind of decision come from in terms of actually formalizing the company together? Chip, I'm going to throw that to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no, uh, we were, when we met at the dinner, um, we started talking and um, it was the idea that I had worked, you know, essentially my entire career in crisis mode, right? That's what the FBI is about. We, you know, you're not going to see us on the sunny days. It's, it's, it's the worst time of your life when you're going to come in contact with us. Mm -hmm. So, so it was realizing that organizations devoted to really crisis work, thinking under stress, um, trying to make a bad situation into one that is helpful and friendly and hopefully life affirming. The and you know that idea along with how do people think under stress? How how is it that they you know some choose horribly and others choose well? So I we were talking back and forth about this and we said look we probably need to talk more about you know doing some work together. So we we tested an idea out. We developed a um, we joined together to to. Uh, put a masterclass together in New York city. Mm -hmm. And was, was this a live, a live kind of workshop or yeah, it was, okay. it was exactly pre COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, <laughs> so uh, we, I, I, I forget Adele, how many, how many months was it for us since we started talking to where we put it on? I would um, say it was like, it was probably like three or four months. Yeah, I mean, three or four months, know, I think. Yeah. I yeah. think when Chip and I started talking, you know, Michael, um, we both were at this, um, you know, I think inflection point in mm -hmm. our businesses where we're like, you know, I, I, I don't really like working by myself. I'd like to have somebody to bounce ideas off of. I thought Chip's um, angle to how he handled things was so interesting and different. And we just had such a, a fun time talking together and like working together that we just said, you know what, it just makes sense for us to put these very different disciplines together. It's such right. an interesting and unique position. I mean, I've never heard, I've never heard of a publicist and a special agent and a hostage negotiator working together. I mean, it seems so opposite, mm -hmm. but yet yeah, it really, it really works. I mean, the way right. people feel after we handle a crisis for them shows it just makes sense. Like, you know, we've had people be like, I felt so good afterwards. I, you know, like this was like life changing. Sure. We had, I was really feeling so much stress. And then you guys came in, you fixed this problem and they mm -hmm. turned it around into an opportunity. And, you know, I was able to do that, um, you know, in my firm before, but just the way we emotionally right. take care of people the whole way, I think is such a different experience. So Adele, was it like looking at the timeline and you, you met at this event, three or four months go by, you're kind of, you know, tennis back and forth of, yeah. of ideas for this workshop. And then you decide to, to run this workshop. Tell me what, what happens in that workshop? Like, did it go well? Just 
I'm very interested. Like, how did you go from doing this workshop together to deciding let's actually create a company together? Yeah. So when we did the workshop, it was sold out so quickly and every person who attended it was just like, God, you got, you guys are amazing. This is so mm. interesting. I want to hear more about it. I want to learn more about it. Um, you know, I always wanted to write another book. Um, you know, again, like, you know, I started out as a journalist. So writing is just like my natural strength. Um, and so what I, I said to Chip, I said, oh my God, it'd be so fun to write a book on this masterclass. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. And it just like started to make sense. We got clients from the masterclass, mm. you know, people automatically were like, okay, how do we hire you guys? Right. Um, how do we work with you? We automatically got such a, um, good feeling from us working together that we really kind of let the market tell us like, right. Hey, you guys make sense. Okay. You like what we're seeing. It's really unique. Yeah. And then, and then I think, you know, um, I think, you know, if you're going to pick a business partner, one that's been vetted, um, from the FBI, isn't such a bad <laughs> option. You you, you, you've I mean? had a cr criminal record check, uh, or, or, or two. Sure, that's it. Exactly. And, and <laughs> Chip, from your your side and just kind of perspective, yeah, really. If, if you're thinking about people who are looking or considering, you know, getting involved in a partnership, is there anything that you and Adele did that you feel maybe didn't work that well, and like you had to kind of work through it together? And then at the same time, anything that you think really did work well, and uh, you would suggest? I'm really looking for like you know, with the benefit of hindsight, what do you know yeah, now right. no, that you would recommend I, I to get others? It. And, um... I, I think in, in answer to your question, Michael, it's that I came with such a um, lack of business experience. I I was only out there for maybe a year mm -hmm. uh, before I met Adele. And so I, I did everything I could, you know, to learn uh, about, you know, the business world and so forth. Um, but when you when you bring that all those things and you're wondering what's the next step and what's the next order it was like adele was so so knowledgeable about the area what needed to be done when it needed to happen what the best opportunities are what's not a good opportunity what are time wasters it just shaved years off the learning curve right. so so from that perspective it was a, it was a good match in that Adele had great experience I needed in terms of the business world. And I brought in a different perspective of how to deal with people from a different set of skills that I that I learned while in the bureau. Mm. How, how do you both run the day to day uh, in terms of your, your roles? Like how do you create a clear enough separation so you're not kind of you know standing on top of each other or overlapping in an inefficient and ineffective way how, how have you kind of gone through that and, and how have you actually separated the, the rules yeah I think um one of the things that chip focuses on is a lot of relationship building sales um you know continuing to keep relationships um he's focusing on you know making clients feel comfortable making them feel valued. Um, whereas, um, you know, I'm doing that too, I hope, <laughs> um, and, 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 and I'm doing some of the, um, some of the day to day, um, is also some of the sales. I think, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of the more practical implementation and application and working with, you know, outside consultants and vendors and things like that. And we've built a business that has good systems. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's like one thing I would say is like, if you have two people, you have to have good systems in place. So we have, you know, we have contracts that are pre-written, we have sales, you know, um, materials that are pre-written, we have, you know, um, a way at which to move somebody along our process that's already done. And then what really what we're doing is just putting um, Chip's emotional intelligence and like a ton of like his knowledge and experience on top of that. And right. I think that's how we work really well together. And um, it's just easy. He's really easy to work with. I mean, I don't know if he would say the same to me, yeah, <laughs> but like, I, you know, <laughs> I think he's like really easy going and like, it's just a really nice combination. It's a really nice, um, you know, yeah. Uh, is, is there anything that, that the two of you have been working through that was a bit of a challenge or is a bit of a challenge that you're just actively trying to sort out? I'm trying to help to like an anticipate for those that are 
looking at partnerships, what might be some red flags or just areas that they need to prepare for in advance? I mean, I think, you know, figuring out um, finances and getting good outside counsel for finance is also good, right? Mm -hmm. So like getting, uh, we have um, like an external CFO who's just awesome. And like, I hate doing accounting and like, it's just awful. I know Chip doesn't love it either, right? We both were just right. like, you don't like this. And it's like, I think when you find the things that you both don't like, especially if you have a partner, go find those external resources. You know, we're consultants, but a lot of times we hesitate, especially as entrepreneurs, right? We don't want to reach out. We're like, we want to do it all ourselves. I think that's one of the you know biggest hurdles that a lot of entrepreneurs have is they just are good at a lot of things. And so they're like, okay, I'm not bad at this. You know, it might take me 17 times longer to file a 1099 than would somebody with this experience. So I'm just like, I'm a big proponent of like, just outsource it. Like mm -hmm. if it's like, you know, if it, it's going to take us a lot of time and we're both not loving it, like let's get it off our plates. You know? All right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So let's, let's now shift and, and talk about sales. You mentioned that you, you both ran this masterclass uh, just before COVID started. And, and from that, you got your first clients for what, what became the convincing company. Um, let's fast forward now. And, and Chip, I know Adele mentioned that you're quite involved on the sales side. So share with us, what have you all been doing after you got those first initial clients from the masterclass? Where's the focus been? Uh, and what's been working best for you from a kind of lead generation business development perspective to, to fill your pipeline with new opportunities and, and clients coming in? Mm. So when when we first started working together, Adele already had an extensive email list. Okay. That's, as, as you know, huge. So we were able to work back on people that she has known, people she has worked for and worked with, people mm -hmm. she's had as clients, and just use that list as huge grounds for reaching back out finding you know there's so much left when um that that is possibility from these from previous clients they if there was a good experience they're always trying to find ways of working with you again yeah and so if you're able to continue to cultivate that to show them just to be in touch with them that's the you know i would say is the strongest portion of it is the outreach is calling these people up asking what they're working on. Do they need any help? There's so much to be gleaned mm -hmm. from that. And the development of the first thing that Adele had me do when we started working together, she is that she, she had me do a webinar with her. I mean, it was like the second or third uh, time we had met. Yeah, exactly. And she said, hey, we're doing a webinar tomorrow. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Okay. My first one, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, fun. And we did it. We had huge subscribers to it. It was amazing. And I didn't feel nervous. I didn't feel, you know, that this was, you know, putting me in a bad position. It was just natural to use the skill sets and help people out. That's what I realized. Yeah. I was like, this is helping people. And when you focus on that, people just, you know, they glom onto that. Hey, Chip, I want to just dig a little bit deeper into, into the, what you were saying. You talked about kind of this reactivation of of past current mm -hmm. clients right kind of diving into the database i think very often people have uh, a more extensive network than they are first kind of you know giving um giving credit for yeah uh, meaning that they have lots of connections on linkedin or people that they've worked with in past jobs or people they met at conferences or business cards you know piling up whatever it might be and the the thought of picking up the phone and calling somebody or sending an email to somebody for, for many is, is, is scary, right? It just, it feels like, well, I don't want to bother people. I don't want to be promotional. So I'd love if either you or, or Adele could share some of the language that you used or a bit of like, here's a template of what we said, or here's what was in the email or on, what we said on the phone call so that people could just kind of hear the, the language or the structure that you all used that, that worked for you to actually check in with people and feel good about it, but also something that was successful in turning those uh, those actions and activities into clients. 
Yeah, Michael, I'd love to talk about one thing that I think Chip is, um, you know, um, Chip never likes to brag about himself. Like as the, as the promoter here, I'm going to do it for him. Um, he's going to hate this. He's so good at making people feel super comfortable. Mm. And like, he is somebody's like biggest cheerleader. He'll get on the phone with somebody and he'll be excited about what they're doing. Like, hey man, I just saw that you did this really cool thing on LinkedIn. Mm. I hate, I saw this article that you were in. I saw that you were connected with this person and you said this on this post. And he gets on the phone and it's just such a natural thing for him to be a connector, which is obviously why he was really good as a hostage negotiator and he was really good as a minister, right? And it's like, he just makes people feel automatically comfortable by getting excited about their success. I think so many people get on a call with a prospect and they're so focused on like, here's the 5,000 reasons why I'm amazing and you should listen to me. And it's like, so, Adele, just nobody to, wants that. You know what I mean? Completely. So sorry to interrupt. I just want to clarify one thing that I think is incredibly important. And I want to confirm this is what, what you're saying or what I think that you're, you're saying and Chip is saying as well as, uh, or sounds like the process. So you're, you're not picking up the phone or sending an email to somebody and just talking about your service and, and what you're doing. It sounds like your approach has been, or, or maybe still is, you're finding something that is, you know, that, that, that person did, it could be a post, it could be, um, yeah, something on a, on a social platform. It could be a talk they gave. It could be you know, a mutual connection but you're personalizing something that you saw, like you're actually doing a little bit of homework on each of these people before you pick up the phone and, and call them. Is, it, is that correct, Chip? Like, did you do that for every single person you were calling or was some people you just pick up the phone and say like, hey, it's Chip from the convincing company. How are you doing? It's been a while. So like, w just give us a little bit more color uh, on that. He's right. an investigator, it's, sorry. It, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's, it's just like, like you, yeah. And we know you already know this, Michael. We know this is for your <laughs> audience, but the idea is that you know, if you're treating this person like a cold contact, it is going to be a cold result. Mm -hmm. And there, there shouldn't be a cold contact. There's always ways of getting to somebody that you, that you already know. And somebody knows somebody who knows somebody. It's always the case, right? So when you're able to see that, like Adele said, that there's an article they put out, there's a promotion they just got, there's something like that. It, just so resonates them and makes them feel, you know, seen and heard when you respond to them and say yeah. something that that connects to that. And there's no reason why you should hesitate to pick up a phone and congratulate somebody on that. And it it just makes an, a conversation natural and warm. Yeah. And then the next things always approach. It's but it's first an interest. I have an interest in you and what you're doing. And then it evolves from there. And talk to us about the transition from making the the initial call or whatever the communication is being about them to what you have found to be most effective in shifting that conversation to them wanting to hear about what you're doing or just being able to have the opportunity to talk about what it is that, that you're doing so that they can potentially, you know, become a client. Right. And it's always the case. It It's always, you know, People after a certain point, they will want to turn it to you if you're if you're doing it in a genuine way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they you know people sniff out. Okay, in about I'm guessing 17 seconds, they're going to go to their pitch. And so what you have to do is understand their their amygdala is almost primed to like get ready, defenses are up, but you never hit it. If you don't hit it like that then they're going to be relaxed. And mm -hmm. once people are relaxed with you, the conversation goes natural. And then they will ask, so what's, hey, what's new with you? What, what are you working on? And then boom. You're, you kind of you have know. to wait. You have to wait for the other person to take mm -hmm. an interest in what you're doing. And if you force it, it feels kind of ugly, you know? Yeah. But, you know, it, it does, right? So, and that's why cold calls can be really awkward. But um, if you do a lot of research, if you understand what people's aims are, what they're trying to accomplish, if you zero in on what makes people feel like, oh, wow, I'm glad people are noticing, I'm trying to position my business, my career, who I am in a certain way, and you just take an interest, and then you can shift like, hey, and then, and then wait for them yeah. to offer. I yeah. just think that's what most people won't do is they won't be patient enough to wait for the flip. Well, and I'll go even one step 
kind of behind that, which is that most people don't even take the time to do any of that initial research or personalization, right? And this is why what the two of you are talking about today uh, in this conversation is probably one of the most important factors that uh, determines your success or failure, uh, right? Success or struggle when it comes to lead generation business development. For everybody who's joining us right now and going, yeah, you know, my marketing's not really working or uh, I'm not really seeing success with sending these messages or these emails, right? Or using this automation tool to shoot out my message to hundreds of thousands of people all at once, right? It's probably because you're not spending the time doing the personalization, right? It's you're treating people as, as numbers, right? Not as, not as people. And that's, this is such a big one. And yes, it takes a little bit more time, but you'll typically see faster results, even though it takes more time, as opposed to you can take quicker action with automation and not personalization, but it's going to take you longer to see results. So, um, well said, this, Michael. Yeah, good yeah. stuff, guys. Thank you for, for sharing that. More. Couldn't agree more with that. And one of the things, um, you know, I, I said to Chip when we first met, I was like, let me ask you a question. Like, as we were forming our partnership, I was like, do you like sales? And he was like, I love sales. And he talked about like all of the things he did as like, you know, selling newspapers as a kid. And like, you know, he went into all these like, and I'm like, I loved it too. And like, you know, you can almost predict an entrepreneur's success based on how much they like to sell. Mm. You know, and just the thrill of it, but also it's just the connection to other people. Do you have a strong interest in other people? Um, you know, if you are asking that question, you're like, okay, do, do you like sales? Is it something you like, you're getting something from them. And like, I just think that's the indicator of a good entrepreneur. It's like, are you interested in others? Are you mm. deeply, deeply interested in what's making somebody tick? And are you going to position your services to what that person's needs are. And that's a lot of what we talk about in the book um, that we're writing right now. And, and this was so fun. We we called up a, a professor. Where is he professor? At Columbia, Columbia. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, ha and his name is um, Dr. Bon Tempo, right? It's such a fantastic like professor name, right? It's like Dr. Bon Tempo said, and um, he's he's such a smart guy. And he he talked about this thing about uh, that's been around for forty years. It's been around, um, uh, and social scientists have studied it, and it's like a continuum of how to be persuasive, influential, convincing. And essentially the idea is you never start, and this for me as a journalist was like such a weird epiphany. You never start with your strongest point first. If you start with your strongest point first, all you do is make the person dig in their heels for whatever they believed before you mentioned your argument, right? So um, the 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 example that Dr. Bontempo gives, which is so much fun, Michael, I'd love to take you through this real quick. Like, it's just a fun experiment. Well, let's do it. it. Let's do okay. it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So on a scale of like, like one to a hundred, what, what do you believe? Do you believe we sent a, um, America sent a man to the moon? What, what do you, what's the likelihood? Like, do you think yeah. it's like a hundred percent? Yeah. hundred percent. A hundred percent. Okay. All right. So, um, is, has there been any other country that has claimed to send an astronaut to the moon? Yes. hundred percent. Who? Uh, Russia, USSR. No, Russia didn't send a man to the moon. They sent a man around the moon. So, so okay, right? So, okay, I'm promised I'm doing this. Semantics, somewhere. you know, yeah. moon, <laughs> beside exactly. the moon. I'm doing this all on purpose, the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. So, um, so when you, have you ever been to the desert? Have you ever been to the desert? Like, have. Have you ever, okay, cool. So you, when you look up at night in a desert, there's no like air pollution, light pollution, right? You look up in the night sky, what do you see? Stars. Tons and tons of stars, right? And, and these days, satellites, but yes. And satellites. Right? <laughs> so it's super, super clear. You yeah. see everything above, right? So let me ask you this question. Why, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and he stuck the flag in, is in the background, it's all completely black. You can't see any stars. Why do you think that is? You tell me. Well, that's where See, I have I'm, to I'm, stop, I'm a consultant. Right? I, I'm, I'm going to ask more questions before <laughs> I provide right, a wrap. Well no, you're so smart. You're so smart. You're handling this really well. So essentially, like, that is what we'd call the convincing cliffhanger, right? Because mm. now what, what you have stuck in your mind, right? Like, the what, what we did was we took you from, like, a place of certainty, 
right? So you were certain, you're like, I'm 100% certain that we mm-hmm. sent a man to the moon. And then we created something called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And we're sort of like, we're saying to you, like, did Russia send one? And you're like, no, I, I think they did. And then we're like, no. And then you're like, oh, maybe I don't know as much about mm-hmm. moon landing as I thought. Then we take you to the, to the um, you know, to the Armstrong example. And now what is stuck in your head, any intelligent, super smart person like yourself, that's too much dissonance in your brain. So you're going to have to go and look it up right now. You, now you want to see that picture. You're going to go to Google. You're going to go to images. You're going to look at that picture. And it's going to show you a bunch of data that's going to support my argument not necessarily what you started to believe. So I'm moving you slowly Mm. down this continuum. Now, if I started out with my strongest point first, which is like, we never landed a man on the moon. You'd be like, this lady's crazy. I'm not, I am not listening to a word she says, because I do believe we landed a man on the moon. There's science. Right. right? Yeah. No, I, so what you're doing is you're creating space for, uh, for the, 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 potentially the buyer or the person on the other side, to recognize or, to, or start questioning themselves, they may not actually have all of the answers. So they become more open to hearing your perspective, your point of view, or maybe your recommendations. So, uh, yeah, certainty is the biggest barrier to being convincing because the right. person already thinks they know. Mm. And if you point out that they don't know, you sound obnoxious. But right. if you take them down the continuum and they learn themselves, hey, maybe I don't know as much about this, then they go seek research. And then you can be part of their research journey. It all of a sudden becomes more collaborative and intellectual and um, research-based. And people like to feel like they're making a decision on their own. They don't want to feel coerced. So would the two of you say, based on on, on this concept, that for a consultant or, or an advisor, someone that's that's working with you know organizations and, and decision makers, that that they should, if if they know let's say, you know, a recommendation or something that uh, their client should do before saying, here's what you should do, or here's the way that, you know, you should be looking at things. Are you, are you kind of advocating for the person going in to ask a bunch of questions first that, that might create that space to get the, like, so just, I want to see like, what is the application of this concept? How do you, how do you think it can be applied in the most effective way for consultants? Yeah. So I had some fun with this, right? Cause I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this with our messaging. And so we started offering this pricing program, right? And like, I'm like, we want to help people price their services. And so you've got to start at the point where there is agreement. Like everybody can agree on one point. Like, you know, we can all agree that pricing your services is one of the most difficult things for entrepreneurs. And then the person's like, yeah, that has been difficult for me. I I can't really figure out what my prices are. And then you start adding the fear, uncertainty and doubt. Like Mm. you're just, you're just, you know, like what if, what if the pricing strategy you're using is not optimal or what if you're leaving, potentially leaving a lot of money on the table, then they're starting to think. And what if your competitors are charging so much more than you and Matt, you know, and you just because you don't know how much the market Mm -hmm. will bear for your service. So do you see how like it becomes more of like they're discovering it mm-hmm. rather than you forcing them? Like right. it's it's a totally different tack, but I think it's really effective. Okay, so I'm gonna put a little um, uh, pin in this for a moment because the two of you are gonna cover this in your upcoming book, which is called Convince Me uh, in a lot more detail. So everybody should check that out. I know you said it's available for pre-order. So check Amazon or all those good places it's published by McGraw-Hill. Um, I want to bring this back though, to you and to your business. Uh, so you got your first clients from the masterclass that, that you did. Uh, after that, it sounds like you had this database, this list that you were able to go to, to reach out to people, uh, that turned into, into conversations. Uh, what I'm wondering now is, you know, today you provide several different services. Um, I'm wondering, is there any service that when you started the business, uh, you found over time wasn't maybe the right one? Like, is there any service that no longer is offered, but you used to offer? I'm wondering how much have, have your offerings changed over the years? Chip, do you want to, do you want to go? Okay. Go. I would say I want to do less public relations work, right? Mm. Like I, I, I think, um, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for 17 years. I come from like 
four generations of entrepreneur. And because I'm a publicist and I have, I've been very successful in this area, it's sort of like um, a double-edged sword because I, I keep getting calls like, hey, can you do public relations? Can you do this for us? Can you, can you get me visibility? And it's like, I can, but should I? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think as um, as a business owner, what you tr what you have to do is go, I can offer a lot of things, but I've got to focus in on the things that I know long term are going to make more sense for my business. And mm. I think that can be really hard for people, especially if you've had multiple businesses, you know, to give up the thing you're good. Like, it's like that's hard. You know, well, so it's you're giving hard. up kind of the short term win slash cash flow that could yep. come from the demand. But you're doing it because there's it's that that offering may no longer be in your uh, you know of interest to you to provide or in your best interest or it doesn't necessarily fit your values or your long term goals. Walk us through that for a moment. How how, do, how are you making that decision? Because for many that's that's challenging. If a client's offering you ten thousand, fifty thousand, whatever you know it might be to provide a service that you know you can provide, but it's not the core of what your new model is. How do you, how do you kind of navigate that decision process in your own mind? I think it's an opportunity cost. I think you've got to keep looking at it. Like, you know, I think you've got to go, okay, if this person is willing to offer me this, I know there are other projects over here that I could be doing that, that are actually better for where I want to take the business long-term. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did when we decided to publish the book. I mean, like writing a book is an, an incredible commitment. Right. I mean, like it's a, it's a long process. What do you mean? Don't I thought you just use like uh, artificial intelligence, chat, GPT, <laughs> put, put a few things, throw a copy paste, done. publish, no, you're no, done. No. <laughs> no, I mean, like no way. Right. I mean, so, we, it, so, you know, what we did was we, we did a long term investment in our business because, you know, Chip told me what he knows and I told him what I know. And we were able to discuss this and, and put this down in such a way that, I think I feel so much more educated as a result of writing the book. I mm -hmm. mean, like, I know so much about Chip's background, what he offers. We created new intellectual property as a result of taking the time to write the book. And I think what is so fantastic about writing, and and I think, Michael, you probably, I would love to hear your perspective on this too. Every time you write a book, um, you're just, you're learning a ton. And you're super hyper focused. You become an expert on that topic much more than you would hadn't you write written the book. I mean, you yeah. can read a bunch of articles, but it's different comprehension. Sure. Yeah, same as like when you teach, right? You, you often learn uh, so much when you're teaching others because you see what lands and what doesn't land. You see what people, you know, just understand right away or where there's uh, a lack of clarity to to work through. So all that makes complete sense to me. But, but I'm still wondering, Adele, like that decision process, when, so, when, when there's money on the table or demand, somebody's knocking at your door, why are you feeling comfortable? What are you telling yourself to go, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say no to that right now because it doesn't fit X. How, what's, what's that switch that you're hitting that's allowing you to forego that opportunity? I think it's, I think it's just long-term vision right? It's, it's like, what do I want my business life to look like mm -hmm. long term? And I gave up having a PR firm with a decent sized staff because I didn't love it. I wasn't, right. I wasn't having fun with it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to create another business where, um, you know, you, you, as an entrepreneur, and I know people listening must, must identify with this, right? as an entrepreneur, you, you live and breathe your business. I mean, right. So if you're not doing something that you love, that you're super passionate about, the world's not going to respond to it. Well, right. You're just not going to get the business. You're not, I mean, I was successful before, but I wasn't loving it, you know? And so I just think that's, that's the filter mm -hmm. that I'm putting on is like, are people going to, to gravitate towards me because they can sense, Hey, this is a passion project. This is, right. I mean, I just think the things that we've done in the book, the stuff that we've discovered, the way at which we approach this is so interesting. And I really am excited for the world to see it. So, I mean, if I take on all these other projects that don't um, serve us, you know, then that's, that we're never going to get to that, that larger dream. Yeah. Uh, Short-term pain for long-term gain right? is mm. another way to, to say it. 
Uh, right. So here, the two of you together, right? You have the, the PR crisis communications background. You have the FBI hostage negotiator, also crisis communications, uh, or just crisis, you know, how to deal with crises kind of uh, experience. You put that together. Uh, you're sitting on now a bunch of uh, intellectual property that you've developed and are continuing to to refine and I'm sure develop new stuff as well. I'm wondering, what are you applying in your own business that you feel has really helped you to, to grow or to land more clients um, that you think others maybe aren't doing, or you maybe just know that people are, are overlooking? What, what's, what's working really well for you guys right now? And I'm especially thinking about, is there anything that's just kind of unique that you feel like, yeah, we we're doing this and it's working really well for us. I have no idea why nobody else is doing this. Tip, can you, okay, so two things. I think predictive statements and the other one is forensic listening. Can you, can you tell them about forensic listening? I think that's a, that's a Yeah, totally sure. So, um, you know, I, I think this goes down toward um, it, how I would answer your question, Michael, is training. I think, you know, our training arm for me is one of the most exciting parts of what we do mm -hmm. uh, right now is that we help companies, executives, sales develop a, a better mindset around, you know, dealing with customers, whether they're, you know, irate or whether they're, um, you know, just regular, they want to find out more or wh whatever they're on the spectrum. Uh, and that comes from what we've, what we've developed is called forensic listening. And the idea here is that we're we're talking about in the training is what does a conversation have to say after it's happened? So we what we do is we examine a conversation when it's over. And to do that, it has to be done. You can do it quickly or you can you can do this over time. But the idea is that forensic listening is that everyone has has a way of of understanding another person mm -hmm. and you can do it either methodically or you can do it haphazardly and we're suggesting a way of doing this in a very um, almost scientific method well, what's an application so, of this like if, if, if let's say a salesperson yeah. is talking to a prospective client a buyer uh how do you track how do you measure the conversation after it's happened great question so what i'm doing as we're talking to somebody is that everyone has an unstated narrative that's going on in their head. And that means that, that they have a belief about you, your product, your company, your service, that they aren't necessarily going to tell you about. Mm -hmm. It may be negative. It may be positive. Who knows? But, it, you know, we all have, you know, thousands of tapes running in our head at any given time about something. So if you're talking to a prospective client, it would be a huge advantage for you to really understand as close as you could to what they really believe about you sure. and your product. Not research, what they're right? saying, not what they're saying, but what right. they believe. Right. Okay. So, so we, how do we do that? Right. So the disconnect, right. That yeah. happens. So understand that what they're saying isn't actually going to be 100% um, the, the total picture. Sure. So now you're going to ask good open-ended questions is, is one way. And predictive also, statements. Predictive yeah, statements. Yeah, Dale, Sorry. go ahead with predictive statements. <laughs> oh, right. So predictive statements are just this. Oh my God, I think they're so fun. Chip is, Chip thinks they're this is a little crazy, but I think it's so fun. So when we were we first started talking, I was like, who are the most convincing people in the world? And they're like, fortune tellers. You walk in, you give them a hundred dollars, and they immediately read you so much so you think they have mystical powers. Well, what they're doing, Michael, is something they're using something called foyer, the foyer effect or predictive statements that anybody can use in sales settings. So Chip, do you want to give a couple? Go ahead. Of okay. Okay. So one of them is you have an enormous amount of untapped potential that's yet to be discovered. And if no, I just, I, I, I don't have any, but I'm, I don't have any potential. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. You know, right? people love yeah. it, but like, right. oh, but, 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 but to just go back to the forensic listening just for a second, you know, Chip is so good at this. Like while I, while I'm asking the questions, he's analyzing someone Mm. literally in real time yeah. we're looking at like chip what are you looking at you're looking at their so like, right so their body positioning what what are they indicating through that and we're and we're differentiating that from from body language right because there's there's a difference and we're also trying to figure out what is it that they're trying to communicate through how they're 
uh, to the questions that they're asking or not asking, right? right. So everybody yeah. has, and there's there's always more to be said from what somebody is not saying to you than what they actually are. Mm -hmm. And you can also understand people, how they interact with others. Right. So all that brings, you know, into context of, of, of who that person is anyway. I'm sorry. And that, that makes sense. So, and I understand the statement that, the, that or kind of the question that you just asked Adele, anyone in their right mind is probably going to answer yes to that unless they're maybe very, very depressed or, or something along those lines. Like, so yeah, of course I have more potential. Um, share a little bit more, like take us a little bit further down that line of, maybe some examples of questions that you could ask that would help to understand or help you to understand what that buyer is actually thinking and truly believes, not just what they're telling you. So Chip, do you want to do the one where you used with hostage negotiators? Like what got us here today? Like that's, yeah. that's a great question that you could use for being a hostage negotiator or a salesperson, right? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, Adele. I, I think, uh, Michael, the idea is that starting where people are, you know, we, we often make the mistake of, um, you know, it, just expecting somebody to be a certain or, or that they are when we greet somebody, you know, we're really expecting them to be at a base level of understanding of where somebody else is. But if you have a little bit of background knowledge about that person, hopefully you do when you meet somebody mm -hmm. um, and it, you you're you you're getting information already. Right. You know, what's their affect? Are their shoulders hunched? Are they? Are they pulling back from you or are they, are they bladed away from you or are they full frontal engaged with you? Are their eyes opened right wide and are they anticipating what you're saying next or are they really trying to get away? So so there's ways of, of, of getting to that. But the idea is that is that if you can generate excitement in that person, what they're doing, what what they're about and you share that excitement with them then you are, you know, that's, that's what we call like the energy exchange. Mm -hmm. You're hitting on something that that person has perhaps felt dormant, but really wants to bring out, you know, I, you know, that maybe like to Adele's point, you know, they're not being utilized at work the way they want to be, you know, say they work for a company and they really want to be in sales, but they're, they, they've been stuck in accounting and they want to get out. How, you know, how, and you say, wow, you know, just from your enthusiasm on on sales, and I can tell that you're the way you're connecting with me. You're obviously a people person. That's an easy transition for you. Let's talk about ways of how you get there. Let's talk about how we're going to bridge you in the future to where you want to be. When you take an interest in somebody like that, mm -hmm. it creates a different level of engagement. Yeah, we call it like in the book, we called it the dial in method, because you're just dialing into that person in such a way. I mean, and like, you know, you get you get people who are not going to match your energy level. Like we had, you know, we were we were selling somebody the other day, super, super low energy. And it's like, you know, you're like, OK, OK. And, and you just have to match your energy to theirs. Slow down your pitch, tone, cadence of your voice to match the person that you're talking to, mm -hmm. which most people will not make that adjustment. They are so that if, level. if we use that as an example, so you're talking here to a buyer that maybe at that moment didn't necessarily seem super interested or just didn't have high energy. Um, what did you both do in that situation to try and tap, like to tap into understanding what's really going on in their mind and, and how can we work with this person to potentially move move things forward to turn it into a win? I think Adele has a great question she always uses um, when we're talking to clients. And it, it kind of cuts away at, at all the, um, you know, minutia. And it's and it's also an exciting ge excitement generator. Adele says, listen, if at the end of, let's say we would work together. And at the end of the year, we were celebrating the success of this engagement and of your company and in your endeavor, what is it that that would look like? Mm -hmm. And it's like, almost like the magic wand sure. question, right? But what it does is that it forces the person to take a look at one, the possibility of success. If I was going to have outrageous success, what is that going to look like for me? And it mm -hmm. makes them say it. When you put words out there, you you're getting a sense of what they're thinking. And if they repeat it, we call that theme development. If you are repeating something a few times, all right, I know now in my head, I'm going to make a mental note. That's significant to that person. Right. Let's start building that thread out. 
So, so that's a great example. And I appreciate you sharing that, that question that Adele, that you always use. Uh, let me ask you for one as well then, Chip. What's, what's one question that you find as a go-to for you that you bring into almost every client conversation or buyer conversation that you just find to be really effective? I think it's, what's the best experience you've ever had? Mm. What, has been, what has been something that has been life-changing for you? I ask people, I, I often ask people is like, what, what event in your life was, was so significant that it altered your course? Sometimes it's a book. Sometimes it's meeting somebody. Sometimes, you know, and when people start identify, it's almost like, you know, how, how Marvel and, and so forth have that, have that be origins narrative. Right. Well, we also do that sure. in our lives. And the great news for us is that we can pick and choose which one we're going to put forward next. Yeah. And I think that's important for people. How, people how, are revealing that all the time, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Yeah, people are revealing that interest mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, um, uh, and so I'm wondering with that specific question, when when do you tend to ask that? Like, is that earlier on in the conversation? Do you wait for a certain level of kind of rapport to be established? Or is there, what's your guidance on when somebody should think about asking a question like that? Because that's that's a very, you could say personal question, but it's also one that clearly just, you know, removes barriers and just allows you to have an, an open flow of communication, you know, person to person kind of level. Hey, Chip, can I just, can I just interject this one thing? Yep. One Please. of the things that Chip does is he's looking at what that person wants to talk about, right? So it's not just like, hey, what do you feel like? Is that this like really like pivotal moment? He'll look at what they've said the whole conversation. And then towards the end is like, hey, tell me about that project or talk to me about something that, you know, you're really excited about coming up or, right? So he's reading the person, the whole conversation and mm -hmm. then, right, Chip, wouldn't you say you're doing yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's you, you know, like we've all, we've all been on calls and that's a very good point, Adele. We've all been on calls with uh, other salespeople and they first want to get out what what they need to get out, right? It's that they, they, they got something they got to sell and mm -hmm. you, you feel it. And even if, you know, there's a, a tertiary kind of nod to something about me, it's going to quickly go back to, well, I got this thing I got to say. Right? So, but, but if we're failing to pick up the nuances about what that person needs and what they're lo really looking for, and if we miss those opportunities for that thing that, you know, it might have been a subtle lilt in their voice that you that you could easily miss if you were like doing emails at the same time right mm -hmm. you hear the, the clickety clack of on the keyboard like okay you're not focused on me right or you they're queuing the, up the next call you did it on the last call that we had chip with the with the guy who had low energy he had mentioned he just suddenly dropped in he's like i have a master's degree in business and they gave me this assignment but i'm not really that in like, you could just um, chip's like oh he's not really interested in doing this they gave him something he doesn't want to do and he's zeroed in on that Mm -hmm. And then make the guy feel comfortable. It's like, oh, you're really a business guy. And the guy was like, yeah. And then he started talking about that, right? Like, it's almost like people have misidentified you. And then you're giving them an opportunity to go, oh, this is who I really am. Right, right. Um, all right, well, we've covered a lot. This has been a quite a tactical um you know, episode here today. And I have so many more questions for you guys about your business, how you got to where you are, but I want to respect your time. And I know we're already a little bit over the time that we had scheduled for today. So um, before wrapping up, what I'd like to do is just make sure that people can learn where they should go to learn more about uh, your company, guys. Uh, I know you have also have your book that is coming out. Uh, I think you said around September of 2023 called Convince Me. Uh, but it's available for pre-order already. You mentioned on Amazon and maybe other fine places. Uh, but Adele, where's where's the best place for people to go to learn more about the company and what uh, you and Chip are up to? Sure, convincingcompany.com. That's our website. So check okay. that out. We'll have that linked up in the in the show notes. Um, okay. One quick question, guys, before we wrap up, because I tend to ask this and I, I, I want to don't want to leave people hanging. Uh, so we talk about your book. Aside from your book, what is uh, from each of you? one book that you've read or listened to in the last six months can be fiction or nonfiction, but just something that you've really enjoyed that you would recommend to others. Gosh. 
Uh, I know this is, is it a bit, does it have to be a business book? No, no, no anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, fiction, nonfiction. Yeah. I really so enjoyed Rob Lowe's book. I thought he had so I don't much. know who, who's, who's Rob Lowe. What, what's the Rob book? Rob Lowe is about? this like teen idol in the U S and okay. he's like, he's like in his fifties now. He's had like a he, kind of mediocre career, but the way he describes his book and like his experiences, it's just so much fun to listen to. And it seems like he's like just been at every like major cultural event and he's somehow crossed into it. It's just, it's, it's just so fun. He tells great stories. Like I so, so enjoyed listening to that. Would really recommend it. All right, good. And Chip, how about you? You know what? I, I was, I was recently listening to, um, uh, a, 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 a radio station and they were playing the soundtrack to uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And and so I, I revisited that book. You know, it's it's just, you know, there's so many lessons that that you can learn from from novels like that, from mm -hmm. the human experience. And, and you know, when when authors go to the pain to describe somebody's back character and emotions that are involved in it, I think it's just it's so enriching and can help you think in different ways about the people you're interacting with every day. So yeah, it's fun. Good stuff. Well, Adele and Chip, thank you again so much for coming on here today and for everybody joining us. Uh, just think about what you can take away from today's episode. What's one thing that you can implement in your business? Maybe it's how you go about asking a question. Maybe it's just listening better. Uh, maybe it's personalizing your your emails or your phone calls or your outreach and just really thinking more about building relationships and focusing on value over volume, but whatever it is, apply at least one thing from the episode here today. Uh, and Adele and Chip, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Michael's pleasure.